Okay, there we can go. Can you see my screen now? We can. Yes. Okay, so I just want to start off by saying that um, we sent a link out. So everything that I'm talking about today, including the books that I'm talking about today, can be found on this website. And I am always looking for new books. So if you have something that you think should be added to our list, please feel free and you can contact me through this website. Um, please feel free to share it with us. Okay. Do you have the URL for that website we can put in the chat? Um, I do, I shared it with Carol. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll make okay. sure I get that out. I'll send okay. that out again to everyone. So my name is Jenny Blackson. I'm going to talk with you about um, a research project I've been working on for the last two years. I want to start out with um, some disclaimers. I am, not a, I am not a member of a recognized tribe, nor am I tribally affiliated in any way. I am an educator and I am curious and that is what Brent brought me to this topic. Also, Central Washington University trains one in five teachers in the state of Washington. So making sure that our students um, are able to meet the changing needs of their communities is really important. <laughs> so um, in 2016, I was given a um, Neville Primbrum Mid-Career Educators um, Award and got to go work at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian, um, the Vine Delora Library, and the Archives of the American Indian Congress. So as librarians, I'm sure you hear all the time, it must be great to be a librarian. You get to read all the time. Um, for three months, that was my job. I, you could have a thousand books at a time out at the Smithsonian. Um, so, my research focuses on the Since Time and Memorial curriculum, the Tribal Sovereignty curriculum for the state of Washington. Um, I am a um, former high school librarian from Alaska, and so my work is really focused on middle and high school level, um, but I'd be very intrigued to start on picture books. Um, and so the Since Time and Memorial curriculum. I'm not sure how many of you are um, familiar with it, but it's a K through 12 legislatively mandated um, curriculum that looks at tribal sovereignty, the nation to nation relationship between the state of Washington, the U.S. government, and tribes. And so it's not arts and crafts. It is a very, very um, complicated issue and how we communicate that to our students and how we educate ourselves are very, very important. The nice thing about Since Time in Memorial is it is inquiry based. So there is no right answer and there is no right material to use. It is place based. So this is the idea that local school districts will work with their local tribes and the office um, of the superintendent of public instruction has a table um, so, for example, I, I work at CWU, so for, um, for Ellensburg, it, it, our partner is the Yakima Nation, but a lot of our students commute from Moses Lake, and that is the Confederated Tribes of the Coville Nation. So, um, what tribe you're working with um, depends on your location, and then it's integrated, and that means that it's not just Today, we're going to talk about the Yakima Nation. It is supposed to be integrated throughout the curriculum, um, particularly the social studies curriculum, but I'm gonna talk about other places in the curriculum that you can, um, you can support. And remembering that this presentation is really for K through 12 educators and librarians. So how do we meet the standards? Well, these are the standards. And if you know, if you're familiar with state science and geography standards, you're going to see that these are very similar to those other standards. That we're looking at how physical geography affects Northwest tribes, culture, economy, and where they chose to settle and trade. We need to look at what the legal status is of tribes who negotiated and who did not negotiate treaties. Um, what were the political, economic, and cultural forces that led to treaties? What are the ways in which tribes respond to threats and outside pressures to ex 
extinguish their cultures and independence? And what do local tribes do to meet the challenges of reservation life? And that's today. So that we're not, we're not looking at tribal sovereignty as some historical um, concept, but we're looking at it in the context of our communities today. So there are some issues in looking at um, American Indian literature. Many things are out of date. The 70s were a fantastic time of publication of nonfiction um, resources about Native American and Alaska Native um, peoples, and that stuff's out of print. We've got a lot of stuff in our collections that are just outrageous. A lot of children's literature is really more about cultural appropriation than education. And there's a real lack of recognition of American Indian and Alaska Native First Nations um, literature. And there's not a lot of scholarship around the topic. So I want to start with out of date. How many of you have this in your library? Not sure. <laughs> so this is a seminal work um, in the field of school library media. It's a great book. It was last updated in 1995. Um, and there's some issues with that. A lot of things have changed since 1995. The Native American, um, or the, the Native American Language Preservation Act was passed after 1995. Kennewick Man was found before after 1995. The Clovis Child was found um, before 1995. So our seminal work is super outdated. And then there are things out of print, and I don't know how many of you have this in your collection. I just got a signed copy donated to my library. But this was part of the Centennial Celebration, the Bicentennial Celebration, and there was actually a whole series of books put out, um, Polish Americans in Washington, German Americans in Washington, but they walked before Indians of of Washington State was written um, by Ms. Carpenter, a member of the Nisqually tribe. It is a fantastic book. It is impossible to find. It goes for about $350 on eBay. Most libraries have moved it into their special collections. And so one of the things that we do need to do as a library community is look at working to digitize and make available some of these works. Now this work is really complicated because I'm still trying to figure out who holds the copyright. Um, but it's a fabulous book, and our hope um, here at Central is we have um, a program called Scholar Works, which, which hosts our student theses, our student newspapers, and our hope is to eventually get um, permission to digitize this and put it up free and open um, to the community of Washington. Outrageous. So I am from Kentucky. I am from the Penny Royal, which was the ancient homeland. Uh, it was the homeland of the Shawnee and the Cherokee and the ancient homeland of the Adena and several Mississippian cultures. And so when I found this book at the Smithsonian, Prehistoric Life on the Olympic Peninsula, I was super excited because I, I um, am very interested in pre-Columbian history. But apparently our ancient ancestors liked to fish topless. This book was just outrageous. The women and I at the Vondelore Library got a lot of laughs and offense from this. You know, all the women are shrews in the book. All the men are completely incompetent. Um, the mosquito bites alone. And so we all have this stuff in our collections. And one of the things that we need to decide is, is it important for us to have these things in our collections for the research of racial bias? or can we remove them from our collections? I would argue that a fifth grader does not have the cognitive ability to assess this book for its um, stereotypes. And one of the things the Vine Delora does, um, because they are very cognizant that librarians go to their catalog looking for books that they've decided to accept, to put into their collection as a guide, but they keep many materials for research on racism. And so one of the things they did in the catalog record for this um, book is they added the, co the, um, the Library of Congress subject heading 
for um, racial stereotypes so that individuals understand that they have this in the collection because it is an example of racial stereotypes. And then what's educational about this? Um, and I talk to student um, teachers a lot about this. I love Clifford the Big Red Dog, but there's no reason for Clifford to be dressed up like this, nor is there for Papa Bear, and it's disrespectful. Um, it, one is this kind of idea of a gene generic Native American, the other is that we're talking about sacred objects being used in a non-sacred way. We don't dress Clifford the Big Red Dog up like the Pope and read those books to our children. And so we really need to look at that. And a lack of recognition, and if that's really changing, and how many of you read Deborah Reese's American Indian Children Literature blog? It's a, if you're not, you should. Um, Deborah Reese is right now probably the foremost expert in Native American children's literature. Um, she does a recommend, not recommend, and what I say to librarians is if she recommends it, buy it for your library. She and I have some disagreements about criteria. She has a specific criteria um, that sometimes leaves out books that I feel um, are very useful in the curriculum. Um, and so I do say sometimes for her not recommended to maybe look a little further and see if it meets the needs of your community. But if she recommends it, she's never led me wrong. And it brings us to, as you'll see, this Native American Nations map. And I get probably three times a week an ad for these um, maps. Um, and we actually did buy them and we cataloged them as um, artistic interpretation because there are some issues with the maps. Um, there's not a time stamp on them, so they're mixing, um, they're mixing timelines. There's been some concern of, from some tribes. Um, and so we had a professor that really, really, really wanted these. And so we did get them, catalog them as maps, but we did put an artistic in interpretation there. And then awards are a great place to go. Um, the Victoria Premier's Literary Awards um, is out of Australia and New Zealand. The First Nations Awards out of Canada. Of course, the American Indian Youth Awards and Indigenous Comic Con. And has anybody heard of Indigenous Comic Con before? Um, I've got to go. It's in Albuquerque every year and it is a highlight of Indigenous comic book artists and video game um, designers. And um, one of the things that I tell librarians is look at these awards. And if that author has won the award, go back and look at their earlier works. Um, this is an author that has been recognized. Also looking in um, anthologies. If um, they published in anthologies, um, go look at their works in well-respected anthologies. And then one of the things that we need to do as non-tribal members is educate ourselves. And there are three books that I suggest that all educators and librarians read. One is Theda Purdue and Michael Green's North American Indians, a very short introduction. And it is a very short introduction. It's 112 pages. Um, and I had Dr. Green and Dr. Purdue as my um, teachers in college. And one of the things that I learned, the most important thing I learned from Dr. Green is that there were a lot of people here. And often in history books, we're given a glimpse of small, idyllic villages with less than 100 people in them. And um, what we know now is that there were 112 million people, at least in North and South America in 1490. That's more than the population of Europe. Um, Dr. Green and Dr. Purdue also look at a lot of how tribes moved in response. And so um, tribes that we think, for example, that are Plains tribes only became Plains tribes because they were pushed out of um, their homelands in Wisconsin and Minnesota, Indiana and Ohio. Nation to nation, treaties between the United States and American Indian nations is a Smithsonian book. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that exhibit, um, but it really gets to the heart of what treaties mean 
and it's also a visually wonderful book and it could be used from sixth grade to college level and then they just put out a new um, ver new edition of do all Indians live in teepees and it is a question and answer format from the National Museum of the American Indian and it's a really good way um, to address your stereotypes that we may feel like we don't have bias and stereotypes but a read through this book will reveal a lot of those and then washington state and this is my main um, bibliography i'm working on now um, teachers and educators need to read about um, the tribal communities the nations within their area and i had never read by delora jr who um, was a long-term um, professor in western Washington um, and is a member of the um, Lakota Nation and uh, actually he's Cheyenne River he's Cheyenne River Sioux and this is my um, warning about Indians of the Pacific Northwest once you read it everything else is going to pale in comparison it is such a beautiful well written book it is a generalized history mainly focusing on west of the Cascades, but his coverage of the fishing wars in the 70s is just unbelievable. Um, and so we all should be reading Vine Delora. And what's really embarrassing for me is I gave this to high school students all the time when I was a high school teacher. Um, and then um, there's some academic works to look at, um, Shadow Tribe, um, it's about the, um, the tribes of the Columbian Basin that did not enter into the Medicine um, Creek Treaty. And then the Big River is a great um, book as well. And what I tell teachers and librarians um, is look in the thank you and acknowledgement pages of these books. And the first thing that you should see is, did they work with a member of a tribe? or a tribal family to write their book. Because many books are written by Anglos, um, and that's just sort of um, the nature of the publishing industry. And so, um, you know, you may be buying books from non-tribal, written by non-tribally affiliated people, and the important thing there is to just make sure that, oh, something just happened to me. Let me go back. I'm sorry. I gotta figure out what happened. All of a sudden, iTunes popped up. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I just gotta get back. There we go. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, and then we have to confront our own understanding of racism and civil rights. And so, when I was a teacher at Sitka High School, our freshman block was um, American history, US history and literature. And we did several reading projects. And the first year I came, I looked at the failure rate and we had a high failure rate, particularly among Alaska native young men. And the first thing I asked was, what are you reading? And what they were reading was pretty boring um, and no context for the kids in the class. And so when we did the civil rights movement, as a literature project. I provided 75 titles for the students to choose from. Um, and we used the absolutely true diary of a part-time Indian as a discussion of civil rights, as we did Sweet Grass Basket. But the thing I say about the absolute true diary of a part-time Indian, and I do know that Sherman Alexie is a controversial figure right now, um, but I'm gonna say that I still love the book, although um, I have some issues with Sherman, but I love the book. Um, I've never given that book to a 12 to 15 year old boy who did not read it and love it. And it is the only funny book about racism that I know. And one of the issues with talking about racism and prejudice, especially with college students, is I can't get their hackles up to the point that they won't listen. So the Absolute True Diary Part-Time Indian is a good way to start talking about racism and education. And then Sweetgrass Basket is written by Marlene Carvel. 
She is not a tribally um, enrolled person, but her husband and her three children um, are members of the Mohawk tribe. And so this book is Sweetgrass Basket. And what I like about it is it's written in verse. And it is about the Carlisle School. And what I tell my students is to look at American history without looking at the residential school. Um, history is like looking at World War II and not looking at the Holocaust. Um, the legacy of residential schools resonates in tribal communities today and is also an issue in um, communication with public schools. I once had an uh, elder in Alaska tell me I don't come to my grandkids events at the high school because school is where the worst things imaginable happen to me. And so I think our future teachers need to know that. And so this is written in verse with the sisters Sarah and Maddie who have been forcibly removed from their home after their mother's death and placed in the Carlisle School. And I'm just gonna give you a little reading from um, the book. And this is from Sarah. My feet are tired from marching everywhere. Like soldiers, we march up and down and down and up and across the yard. We march to our meals and to our lessons and to work and to church services every Sunday morning and Wednesday night. My feet are tired from marching everywhere. And so, you know, especially with adolescents, um, really looking at things from an adolescent perspective, we can use um, young adult literature across the curriculum and collection. So when we did our unit on the Civil War, there were a couple of um, books that we used that were about Native American um, regiments in the Civil War and Native American regiments fought on both sides. But Between Two Fires is a great nonfiction book. And again, it's a beautiful book with not lots of white space and good font and nice pictures. We read Mary Crow Dogs, a Lakota woman during the civil rights, um, the civil rights um, unit. Um, and young women love this. Mary Crow Dog um, is a member of the Coda Nation. She had a child at the, she gave birth at the siege of Wounded Knee. It starts with her childhood, goes through the residential experience, school experience, and it just has a lot of things that young women, regardless of their ethnicity, can really relate to. And then like a hurricane, the American Indian movement from Alcatraz to Wounded Knee is great because it's short stories. When we talked about World War II, we um, read Aleutian Sparrow, which is about the forcible removal of the Aleut people during World War II from the Aleutians, as well as Joseph Broshot's Code Talkers. Um, Joseph Broshot has never written a bad book. I'll just say that. And then when we talked about, we did a unit on migration and immigration in our Alaska, stu and our students, lots of our students wanted to say, oh, I'm from German descent, so I want to read about German immigrants. My family was from England. I want to read about English immigrants. And then here I was in a school that was 10% Alaska Native. And so we decided to look at books on migration um, of of Native American peoples. And one of my favorites is Two Leggings, The Making of a Crow Warrior, and that's his autobiography. Um, it's a great for your advanced readers. And then The Great Death. And you know, I'll talk a little bit about Deborah Reese. Deborah and John Schmelzer have had quite the conflict going on for a couple of years now. That being said, I love John Schmelzer. Um, and I love John Schmelzer because it is books that adolescents will read. And The Great Death is about the influence uh, epidemic and its impact um, on Native communities. And the book starts out with The Great Death came upriver with a white man with red hair and dark spots. And this man comes into their village and infects the village with um, influenza. And these two young women are the only survivors and have to walk out and find other people. We can definitely look beyond history. Washington State standards for art, for English language, for social studies, for science, for math,
for health and physical education, remembering that um, Washington has um, an HIV mandatory curriculum and infectious disease, and First Nations out of Canada are doing some pretty incredible work around HIV infection and Indigenous people. And finally, world language. So I was really lucky to teach at schools where um, we used Clinket as you could take Spanish, French, or Clinket. You could take German, Spanish, or Inupiat. So why aren't we including indigenous languages in our world language program? I'm gonna be running over a little bit. Um, so I'm not gonna show this video, but I have links to it. And this is a group of individuals um, from the North Slope who created a video game that I'm gonna talk about. We can also use um, American Indian literature to talk about tough issues that are universal in the lives of young people. So off sides, sides and who will tell my brother are both about racism and sports and the use of um, indigenous, um, indigenous mascots. Rain is not my Indian name is about being white enough to pass and what that means in this young woman's life. The Trap is another John Smelser book that's about all kinds of traps, alcohol, um, when, you know, when it's time, to, how you can respect an elder but still make sure they're safe. And then one of my new favorite authors is Ms. Flores, and she looks at the intersection between racism and sexual violence. So The Missing is about the missing Indigenous women of Canada, which there are tens of thousands. Um, and then One Night is about a young woman who is drugged and sexually assaulted and is trying to hide her pregnancy from her parents. And then graphic novels. It's a great time for graphic novels and indigenous authors. Um, and um, Red, a Haida Manga, is just an incredible piece of art. Damon Moncheres and um, Ishmael Hopes, The Strong Man, which is out of print right now, but I'm trying to work to get that back in print, um, is a fantastic um, graphic novel. And then The Seven Generations comes out of Canada, and it is about multi-generational trauma. Um, Sugar, Hill Fall, Sugar Falls is about residential schools. And then my favorite, Miss Starr's um, Super Indian. And the great thing about Super Indian is it's a great comic book, but in every issue, there's a page that says, now let's see a real Native American um, superhero. And Jim Thorpe and several other individuals are featured by her. I'm about out of time, so I'm well, going to go through. Actually, I have that you got another 10 minutes or so if you okay, want to I'm take, take go it. Through it. So when we're working with schools, how do we start? Oh, with students. One of the easiest places to start is Washington's Integrated Environmental and Sustainability Standards because just like since time immemorial, it's a K through 12 curriculum and it's supposed to be integrated throughout and there are three parts of it and these are gonna look familiar to you. Ecology, social and economic systems, natural and built environment, sustainability, and civic responsibilities. That looked a lot like STI, but we can partner them. And so I suggest you start with a macrocosm, the larger okay. issues, and then bring it back to Washington State, and then you try. And the first one is Trickster. And it's an American Indian graphic novel. There's 27 different tribes represented. It's a great way, and I have a link to one of the stories um, on this. It's a great way to look at how natural environment influences culture. So it has all our trickster stories, but they have them from the Great Plains and from the Southwest and from Nantucket and from Alaska. And the story and the visual really help you see how um, how nature, the environment, and culture come together. The next book is Native Defenders of the Environment, and it looks at what mostly young Native Americans are doing today. And so we can look at 
environment and it's tied up to um, a specific tribe. And then we go to look at today and what specific tribal members are doing to protect the environment. And again, it's, it's beautifully visual, nice white space, nice pictures, nice font. And this did win the American Indian Library Association Award a couple of years ago. And really, the Native American Trailblazers series is awesome. You should have all of them. And then Never Alone. And Never Alone is a video game set in the Arctic. It's a lot like Mario in that there's a lot of jumping and running. But also it really looks at that relationship between Inupiat culture and the environment. When I heard about this game, my first mindset is, why didn't we have this in the beginning? Having tools like this, doing anything and everything you can to empower the teaching, that's something that I've always wanted to see happen because there's a connection from my generation to my kids' generation. And this game is going to take it to the next level. But I think it's something that is a stepping stone of, of what's to come. It could be at the level where you can actually learn something in such a short time. <coughs> I knew this was gonna come someday because of how fast technology is rising. but to use it to share what I know and how I grew up. <laughs> to share our traditional way of life. That's something else. And that is something I could say that I'm proud of being a part of. Okay, now I just have to get back. <laughs> um, and so this video game um, is called, um, there's, there's a couple of them, um, and they were all done by um, members of the North Slope Borough, but it's a really good way to show, again, how that culture, environment come together, and then we can get into the changing Arctic. Um, the Last Days of Shishmaref is about the village of Shishmaref in Alaska that was forced to move because of um, global warming and the rising storms in the Chukchi Sea and the, um, the um, melting of the permafrost. This is the disclaimer on that. It's a Dutch movie. And if any of you have ever watched Dutch films, it is long and it is quiet. <laughs> Um, but there are clips of it that are great because it um, features teenagers living in the village as well and showing really how this changing climate is going to change the way that a community that has lived there for at least 12,000 years is going to have to, to move. And then I'm going to bring us now to Smithsonian curriculum. And so the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian has some fantastic curriculum and they actually have internships for K through 12 teachers to come teach their curriculum in the DC schools. And so the reason I chose the American Indian response to um, environmental challenges is one, it's a great curriculum, but two, it features a Washington tribe. And so we can go in and there are many things. There's the getting started, meet the people about our homeland, the environmental changes being um, faced, what their strategies are to um, meet those, and what the future is. And it's rich with, well, my mind's not working now, but it's rich with, um, with oral histories, with games, with videos, with film. It's just a really great um, curriculum. 
and then woven together, weaving the traditions of um, the Pacific Northwest. Again, looks at art. Let's see if it's going to let me in. Art and the environment. And it's not. Sorry about that. Um, and then once we look at all of that, you know, right in your way. Macrocosm, we can come back to the microcosm. And for us in Washington, that was salmon, the salmon apocalypse. The Grand Coulee is an interesting film because it's about the um, you know, engineering marvel, but then we get the effect. And there's a great video slideshow and a segment on the effects of the Grand Coulee on the Cold Deal Nation. Well, yeah, so it's a really great resource as well. And then finally, and there's a link to this um, on the website that you shared, is that now we can come down and look at specific Washington tribal, um, tribal activities and local challenges. And this is from the Mid-Columbian Intertribal Salmon Recovery Center. And it's a workbook that you can print for free that's protecting and restoring watersheds, a tribal approach to salmon recovery. And I have a link um, to their website as well because they do have some great science curriculum. <coughs> and finally, Nation to Nation. Um, the Smithsonian is just really incredible. And so um, they have an educators um, section full of um, curriculum, exhibits, online exhibits. They have a great um, one about um, the code talkers from multiple, multiple tribes. And then finally, I just want to tell you that I was able to do all this through the Smithsonian Libraries. Um, and then I also, so if you really need to look at Smithsonian fellowships because I was a Smithsonian employee for three months, which meant that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I could go into any Smithsonian and behind me is the new museum of African American history and culture, which I got to go to the sneak preview of, which was pretty cool. Okay, so I've stopped sharing my screen. And I have stopped with my video. So that is my presentation. Do we have questions? This is, we've left some time. Sandra Toro did join us, and I don't know if she's back. I don't um, see her back yet. But uh, real quickly, is, that's Linda that's on the phone, correct? Linda, Linda, we're, Linda is from uh, joining us from the Shoalwater Tribe. And welcome, Linda. And uh, just for anyone who joined later, we are going to put this up, and I will send it out as soon as Jeremy gets the uh, it mounted up on YouTube. We'll share the link with there, anyone, so that if you had someone you, who you know a staff member who was unable to come, or you came late, or whatever, the full presentation will be up on YouTube. So, any questions for Ginny? What? Thank you, Ginny. That's it's just a a very comprehensive, wonderful resource, and I think for those of us who are into all of us in. Washington State have different uh, missions. Some of us are support uh, youth homework support, or we do uh, preschool, or we do for public libraries, or we do research. So there are a variety of, of missions that our tribal libraries have. And so anyone, you have any questions for Ginny? And you can type them. We'll watch the, we'll watch the chat if you want to go that way. But anybody, you can unmute your, your things. And I see everybody's muted. So if you have a question, um, don't hesitate to unmute and ask. Okay, Linda. We look like you're. That might no? just uh, the phone. Unfortunately, is a little harder to mute and unmute, and so it picks up everything. Okay. Claudia, did you? I'm just. I guess we're just seeing it. I I'm wondering about um, on the resource list. Are that most of the things on your resource list still available in print, or are we going to need to find them on the secondary market? Most things are um, available, um, readily available, because all of them are books that I've used in the classroom. 
Um, I try really hard not to um, give folks books that they can't get their hands on. Um, some of the um, Erica Eccleson books are out of print, um, but other than that, everything is, um, is in print. Um, and there's even on my resource list, there's some um, books about, uh, there's a great book about Washington tribal music with CDs. Um, but I try really hard not to put things up um, that you can't get access to. <laughs> Any other questions? And of course, I think, Ginny, do we have, I believe we have your contact information. And so mm -hmm. if you, you think about it, you can probably contact Ginny after the presentation. And I'm going to share my screen just one more time. Um, well, maybe I'm not going to share my, oh. Well, you have time. Sandra, I know Sandra was here and then she vanished. <laughs> so we hope that Sandra should be joining us just momentarily, I hope. I'm going to try again to share my screen. Can't figure out what I'm doing wrong here. Share screen. There we go. Um, so just to kind of follow up about our library, let me see if I can get this up here. Again, everything is here. Um, let's see if I can move this over. I, I certainly welcome, welcome, um, any contributions um, that others would like to. And then if you're at all interested, um, we do have a library science program here at Central. And um, we offer an undergraduate minor, and we also offer what's called a type B certificate, so you don't have to be enrolled in the university. And we also are very willing to do um, custom trainings. Um, for um, librarians, including if you want to do a cataloging or a public service, we're always happy to do those as well. But if you have um, staff members who are interested in some training, we do offer um, a Type B certificate. Handy to know. Handy to know. And so I'm going to try to unshare my screen now. Okay. Well, I think. Um, I, I'm going to try and just do some, um, I'm going to quickly email Sandra and see what she is going on here um, and see what, okay, and then, but in the meantime, I was wondering if we could have, um, Bonnie, could you unmute your, um, your microphone and share a little bit about you did say a little bit about what you're going to do but if you know about what you might be doing in the summer if there are any special programs that are going on in your library or if you or Jan either one um, Bonnie did say either one could, could could chat a little bit more fully about you know some of the programs you have we'll share around what I'd like us to do is kind of share around the, the circle and um, talk about what's going on in your library what you're excited about and uh, do a little bit more while we wait for Sandra. So, Carol, um, this yeah. is Jenny. I have to run to a meeting. Okay. Um, so I'm going to leave you. Uh, thank you all so much. And please well, thank feel you. free to email me or call and we'll discuss books. Sounds, that would be, we may take, well, take you up on this. I have, we have talked at our last face-to-face -face tribal meeting about doing a project across the state involving collection development and developing things that were out of print and see if we could bring them back for print on demand and then printing out copies for everybody in every tribe and getting them that way for children's literature especially. We talked about this, but we haven't quite put it together. Or I haven't, I should say, I and haven't quite put it together. One of the things I really want to point out on the website is that I have a link to the state of Montana's, um, because Montana was the first state to um, have a legislative mandated curriculum on tribal, tribal sovereignty. And I have a link to the book, a booklet that they did that's all about evaluating American Indian children's literature. And it's awesome. And so I'm going to go because I have, we're renovating and they're tearing apart the second floor. So um, I look forward to hearing and thank you so much for letting me join you. Well, thank you again. We appreciate your expertise. Have a great day. So thank you. All right. So um, Jan or Bonnie? Can you? 
Um, does it work for you to come on again, unmute your things, Bonnie? Yes. Um, we, we do kind of back off on our programming in, in the summer, but we have a, um, an event coming up for the kids, and I'm going to let Jan tell you about that. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, well, we're going to have um, 34 kids from the ages of 5 to 10 for one day of programming, and we're going to um, get Brad Griffith, who um, is a contractor and inventor of how to bend craft sticks, those popsicle stick kind of sticks and all kinds of little woods like that. And um, he's figured out ways to bend these things into shapes and then he teaches kids how to build with them and he can build, he, he um, did one project where he sponsored the Puget Sound popsicle stick bridge building competition and they shipped in like 40,000 um, of these popsicle sticks and um, they did this big competition in building bridges and he's got several websites which I can forward that information to you. Uh, one of them is uh, craftsstickcrafts.com but he's, um, he's going to come and show the kids. He's, they're going to build uh, something like a Flintstones car and so it has some of the STEM principles of engineering and, and um, um, I don't know what, what else to say about it. But if, if you go on his website, you can just see hundreds of projects that, that he's built and shared with the kids on how to bend and twist and shape and mold these wood products into all kinds of um, gifts and crafts. So we're hoping that uh, the, the kids will have a fun time doing that, learn some, something about um, engineering and building while they do so. That's great. And so what are your plans for the fall? Do you, I, you must be thinking ahead, or are you just like, oh, I'm not going to think about that till the end of July. <laughs> Turn that over to Bonnie. Well, we're, we're working on it. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we've got our films starting to line those up. I've uh, got a couple of those in the pipeline. And we're also trying to get um, Elise Crone, uh, who is an expert in uh, uh, use of native plants uh, for medicine and food and uh, cultural things. And so we're trying to get her up here for some, some workshops for our tribal folks. Um, beyond that, we're, we don't have anything, we're, we're still working on it. Oh, that's good. That's good. Just do plans ahead. But your general programming load is you do like a program maybe nine months of the year or eight months of the year? How many? Eight months? Well, nine. Nine? Ten. Okay. Okay, great. Just, you know, this is, they have a lovely, if you haven't stopped by the Heron Library, it's a very uh, renovated facility and very attractive and nice. So who... Um, the Jacob, so either Marida, Kat, or Jelena, do you want to talk to us about what's going on at Yakima? Jolina? <coughs> Hi, this is Marida. Can everyone hear me? We can. Yes. Yeah, we're from the Yakima Nation Library. Uh, sorry I was a little late. Um, we just got back from ALA in New Orleans yesterday, so we had a lot of catch up to do yesterday and then today um, well I appreciate Caroline's reminder to attend this meeting so <laughs> I was like oh yeah that's right <laughs> um, so know. some of the things uh, oh we saw Janessa I don't know Janessa from Cobble if she's yes. in the meeting Is no she, she isn't she wasn't able to join us apparently oh okay um, well, she was probably doing the same thing because we saw her at ALA in New Orleans, so we were at some sessions together. Um, but she did come and visit, and she saw some of the things that our library is doing, and she um, absorbed it all. And she she actually took all the information we gave her, and she implemented some of the things with her library. So, would you want to share? Would you share what those were? Yeah, so I was telling her that um, we do um, book distributions through our 
commute throughout our community at different things so um, I told her that first book is a good resource to get um, cheap books to um, give to the children um, and she actually had her first book distribution at Pascal Sherman so um, she signed up and she was eligible and um, I encourage um, other libraries to do the same because that's a whole part of um, the issue with reading literacy among Native American children is to get those books in their hands. Um, so like where we're located, we don't have a lot of bookstores and um, we have our library, but there's um, communities that, you know, they're not immediately um, located in uh, to access our library. Um, so she said she had good results with that and um, I was happy that she did that. And then also I recommended to her to uh, attend, become an ALA member and uh, she did and she just, she went to uh, New Orleans and we thought that she wasn't gonna get to go but um, she showed up and then she's also planning to end, attend ATOM in Minnesota and I think that's, can't remember when it is, but October. Uh, I think so. Oh, hi, yeah. Sandra. Oh, Sandra's here. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's great. Hi, Sandra. So <laughs> I talked to her yesterday, so maybe we, we had some issues with Grant, so I'm not sure she's going to talk about that. Um, uh, one of the things, so I just kind of came in a little bit at the end of what uh, Jenny was saying. Um, some of the sessions um, in New Orleans had to do with um, stereotypes of American Indians in children's literature. Oops. So I did hear that um, she was recommending something that Debbie Reese had, I guess maybe was against some of um, John Smelcher's work. Um, so she said she likes his work. I haven't read Debbie Reese's review of what she did not like about his work, but that's one of the things that I would recommend is people read her reviews because that is what an issue is right now is stereotypes of children in American Indian literature and how we're represented or the history is misinterpreted. So I'm hoping maybe Jenny or even I could like I don't know if everyone reads Debbie Reese's blog but I highly recommend it um, she also did advocate to get the um, I don't know if everyone's read Little House on the Prairie but she did a good presentation at the um, ALA as well as other people so it wasn't just from an American Indian and children's literature perspective, there was other um, people from different um, races that said where they were misinterpreted. So um, yeah, so the Laura Ingalls, The Little House on the Prairie, um, she advocated to get that award, um, that name changed, the Wilder and, Award. And it was, it is, yeah. it, it was changed. Yeah, so um, that's just to say that, you know, if anyone, uh, did not see that announcement, you know, and she was actually in the room when um, ALSC announced it and I was really happy for that, but I wasn't one that was like really like going full full steam like Debbie was and um, And I know Debbie she was in my circle of learning cohort the one the um, two for um, Natives, there was a Native American cohort to get their uh, master's degrees in library science, which was from IMLS through so. Um, that was just what I wanted to mention. And then also, um, there was another session at ALA and it had to do with Native American authors. And she mentioned uh, Joseph uh, Bruchek. Um, he also, he has a new book coming out. Um, Eric Gainsworth, um, how she mentioned um, Sherman Alexie's book, um, how it deals with racism in like a funny, like junior level way. Um, he has a book called "If I Ever Get Out of Here," and that's a real, that's a real. It's like a junior uh, 
fiction book and it's it's kind of a it addresses the issue but then it's also kind of in you know a funny way and then also Cynthia um, Ledick Smith she's gonna have a new book coming out and so um, those are some uh, the other authors that I would recommend um, but our other activities um, we're going to have our um, multimedia workshop coming up it's our youth workshop and it's centered around uh, cultural preservation and we entice the uh, youth with our technology so we have um, well, we're going to have our tribal library, the next tribal library meeting here at our library. So you guys will be able to see our multimedia room. And Cindy Aiden, she was here. She um, visited. Uh, I showed her my little, I called it a little multimedia room slash teen space. And she was surprised how um, small it was. But, you know, we can still fit, you know, our whole club in there. Um, but we're in planning phase for our workshop that will be July 23rd through the 27th and the kids will be working on uh, little mini documentaries about um, traditional foods and then also they another part of the group they do a performance and they do they rehearse throughout the week to present a play and all of that is um, presented on the 27th to the community and everyone's invited and then the kids have a barbecue at the end for anyone to um, like ask them questions and just a nice send off for the community that supported the youth throughout the week um, and during at that very end of our workshop we're also going to be starting our book fair so um, we'll have our book fair for two weeks um, by that time we'll have two summer youth workers so we put them in charge of setting up the book fair and um, all the promotional things and then in the fall we'll start our head start storytelling where we give each of the students that's where we um, get a huge order from first book and each week we give a book to each student after the librarians do their storytelling to build their at home libraries so by the end of the year they should have approximately 30 to 36 books by the end of the school year that's wonderful that's just and then, wonderful yeah and then other community events that we have is um Dr. Seuss Day, uh, we do a book distribution and other um, programs um, heard about our event and they set, they set up little crafts, activities, uh, face painting and so the, the event has just gotten bigger and then after that we have a Star Wars Day and we do the same thing. Um, that was fun. I was there to see the, the aftermath. That was great, great props, great props. Yeah, so that was... Um, Oh, and then just as a side note, going back to that, when we were talking about stereotypes of children in uh, literature, uh, Jason Reynolds, um, he did a good uh, presentation along with Debbie Reese. There was a couple others, but I can't remember their names, but it's on the ALA, um, you know, some of the uh, programming that was on there. Um, I don't know if Jolena or Kat have anything to add. We have... We, I mean, we're just always have something going on. Uh, they're laughing in the background right now. They're like, no, I think you got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Oh, yeah. The TV white space. That was yes. the um, cat's like, white space, white space. Um, that is a project that uh, we got a grant through um, kind of sub awardee through uh, San Jose State awesome. University. And it's something that can help um, tribal libraries that don't have a lot of internet access. Um, we're still waiting for some equipment, but it's actually using TV white space to um, provide Wi-Fi. So our signal is going to come out from our library, and it can reach within a seven-mile radius. So we have some tribal housing communities that we're, we've designated to um, set up Wi-Fi Wi-Fi, so that will help our um, community members. We have community members that they'll ride the bus, like from White Swan, and you know how riding a bus is just not a direct route from there to our library. You know, it'll probably take 
with every stop that that bus takes it'll take them like hour and a half to two hours just to get here to use our library and then they have to you know do that same route back to get home so that's one of the things we're trying to alleviate is to like have ag more access to Wi-Fi where they're at so they don't have to travel as far I did submit an um, where well I, I'm hoping that the white space that we have a signal out by the time everyone comes for the tribal libraries and if we have time you know um, we could I don't know maybe we'll show pictures where the antennas are set up but then um, as a follow-up um, we did submit a grant proposal for the um, enhancement grant um, to um, get a bookmobile to like also bring books out to where uh, people can't access our library. So, um, we've um, got a vehicle, two, two vehicles donated to us, so we're just, um, you know, either way, if we don't get the grant, you know, it'll help, it'll happen later than sooner, but if we get the grant, then it'll help, it'll happen a lot sooner. So um, that's some of the future plans that we're uh, working on, so. That's one right. of the things that, you know, we're just right. always busy. Well, we'll, we'll we look try. For, that's good. We will look <laughs> forward to all of us, our face-to-face -face meeting the day before WLA uh, uh, gets going. So it'll be Tuesday, October 16th. If we have that actually at the end of our slides. So okay. um, if I think either Claudia or Brian or Linda, um, I don't know. Uh, it probably isn't fair. Brian has just gotten there to Lower Elwha. So maybe we'll give him a pass unless he wants to say anything. So, um, Linda, we want can to do you a quick um, audio sound check, check for Sandra? Yeah. Okay, Sandra, can you say hello? Hi, can you hear me now? We can. Yes. Hi. Yay! Thank you for <laughs> sending me instructions. <laughs> okay, yeah, my pleasure. Okay, great. Well, um, we're going to just quickly, if you can hold on, we will Hi. talk to either uh, Linda or Claudia. Hi. Do you want to? Okay, Claudia, do you want to say something about what you're going to be doing maybe this summer or some programming that's going on? Yes, hi, I'd love to. We've got a lot of plans at um, the Little Boston Library. We're a, a public library on the um, Port Gamble Sklalem Reservation in Kingston, Washington. And every summer, the tribe offers uh, to give us a, in, a summer intern, a teenager, and they come for four hours a day for a whole month. So for the month of July, we'll have, have a helper um, learning how to use, uh, how we uh, operate the library. They'll be helping with our summer programs. Um, they'll learn how our library works, pull books off the shelves for holds for us. They'll learn how to shelf books. They'll learn the databases. We're gonna put them to work and um, we have a lot of programs in store for the kids, uh, a lot of STEM programs planned. Our youth services librarian, Whitney, is going to be super busy, so she's going to need that summer helper. Uh, one of our programs is about bug eating and how it's the food of the future, apparently. So the kids are going to learn about different kinds of proteins and if they want to sample some bugs they get to sample some bugs we also have um, a be an egg, egg drop engineer um, everybody's done this growing up you get an egg and you have to like protect it with padding and you get all kinds of materials and then it gets dropped off a, a, a high place like a ladder um, we're trying to get a crane but we'll see if we were able to do that Somebody knows somebody. Um, we have a Be a S'more Scientist, which is about solar ovens. And kids are going to try to make s'mores using, I think, tin foil. If we have a sunny day, it'll be a success. If it's not a sunny day, I don't know what's going to happen. And then there's, the, there's going to be a geocaching unit, too. We're going to get some GPSs, program them and have kids find geocaches that are hidden, you know, on the library grounds and um, nearby. So um, we're really excited. Yeah. Great, well that sounds like lots of fun. 
lots of good fun. So Linda, um, I believe you're on the, on the phone. Could you share? I know Linda always does very interesting programming. So Linda, what's going on in Ed Shoalwater? I don't know how to unmute it. You're good. We can hear you. Oh, you can hear me? We can. Oh, okay. Well, um, we got quite a few things going on. Let's see. Um, we got general council coming up, so we're going to close for three days for that <laughs> in August. Um, I've got a new boss, and he wants to learn how to work in the library, which is awesome because then I don't have to worry about when I take off and no one's here to cover. That's good. Um, <clears throat> yes. And uh, got tons of programs going on. Um, I can't even think what we've got WASP. It's called the Women's Air Force Service Pilots of World War II. They're going to come. Um, <clears throat> I have all kinds of things going on. Did you do? They're coming. We're going to do a demonstration on how to didgeridoo. And uh, I'm taking vacation for two weeks. That's always important. Yay. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to Atom, and I am also going to Yakima or WLA. And I'm Good. bringing Christy with me, which is the gal that works in the museum. She's coming Good. with me. Good. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, wonderful. Busy. Thank you. Busy. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we've gotten everybody. So now that Sandra has been able to join us, we appreciate your 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 sticking with us while we finished up what we were doing. So, Sandra, um, I'm just going to turn the floor over to you. If um, if you have announcements that you want to hear, you we'd like to, you know, tell us as a group. And then this is going to go out. We're, we are taping this, so other people will be able to listen to it later. So the floor is yours. Great. Thank you. Um, I was fortunate enough to go to the Tribal College Librarian Institute a few weeks ago. Um, that was my second time, so I was really happy to be able to meet with people in person and um, just get to experience, um, you know, the dialogue between the Tribal College Librarians was really nice. So hopefully I'll be able to do that again next year. Um, right now, it's been a little bit crazy at IMLS because we're in the process of um, checking all of the basics and the enhancements and the Native Hawaiian grant applications for eligibility and completeness. And the past two years, uh, we have had more requirements. You know, for example, forms have to be a PDF, not a Word document. This year, we have a new budget form. So it's a, it's a lot of obstacles that the applicants have to go through, and it is a lot of um, time in terms of processing. So I apologize to everybody for that. Um, we hope to get through that process for the basic grants um, within the next few weeks and then make a, award notifications in July. And we have review panels coming up for the enhancement grants. And I'm not allowed to say too much about the review panel, um, but we also hope to make the award announcements or sometime at, in mid-July or at the end of July. Um, and the Native Hawaiian applications just go through field review, so reviewers um, read them in their um, home state and then send us their comments electronically so they don't come to DC to talk about the um, proposals and for those if there are any questions about scores or anything like that then we just have a phone call so like with the basics and the enhancements we're hoping to make announcements about the Native Hawaiian awards sometime at the end of July um, I think our notice of funding opportunity says the award will be announced in August or September, but we're hopeful that we can do it sooner. Um, but if anybody, I know at least one person on the call has applied, um, I'm not really allowed to talk about applications that are under review 
um, in the case of the enhancements and the Native Hawaiians. But if you have questions about your basic grant, um, feel free to email me or give me a call and I can help you with that. Um, again, it, it, there have been a lot more kind of requirements in terms of the forms and the paperwork. So most of the applicants have some kind of question or need some kind of help to get the right thing submitted. And I'm hoping that there won't be any more changes for next year that will be kind of stable in terms of what's required for both the basics and the enhancements. Um, and that includes the three categories that were new this year for the enhancements. Um, so other than that, um, which is taking up most of our time um, in the office these days, we are trying to get ready for the ATOM conference. Our grant team meeting will be on Monday, I believe it's October 8th. And we've been trying to work with ATOM to get that grant team meeting moved closer to the actual conference days so people don't have to stay a whole week, um, you know, at the, at the conference. So it's possible, we couldn't do it this year, but it's possible that next year we may be able to move the grant team meeting close so that it's the day before the conference instead of two days before. Um, and you can use either your basic money or your enhancement money to attend ATOM. If you have an enhancement grant now or if you get an award in um, July or August, um, I would love to have you give a presentation during the grantee meeting, and that can be um, like 15 minutes or 20 minutes, um, and it can be whatever you'd like to share. But I found that it's um, a really nice opportunity for grantees to talk to each other about both the things that are going really well and then the challenges they've had, like pulling together advisory committees or um, dealing with um, contractors or consultants, things like that. So if you're interested in giving a presentation at the ATOM grantee meeting, please let me know. And we'll have other sessions throughout the week um, where we'll talk about budgets and performance measures and all kinds of things. Um, in addition, um, we are trying to move away from having long webinars that explain how to fill out the paperwork and get your grant submitted. And one proposal has been to move towards short YouTube videos that are more like to quick tutorials. Um, so if anybody has any thoughts about if that would be better, um, please let me know. And if you have other ideas for how we can help people with their applications, um, I'm uh, welcome to hearing any suggestions you might have because I don't think that our webinars are very successful right now. They're really long and there are a lot of information. And what I'm hearing is that rather than sitting through an entire webinar, people would rather just download the transcript and then look for the information they need and work with that. So any thoughts you have or ideas about how we can better help applicants figuring out how to apply, that would be great. And I think my final announcement is that next spring, we're planning on have, having a grantee showcase with the Library of Congress. Um, we had one last year, and this year there were some complications that they're going through some changes in terms of their structure with um, FedLink. And so we couldn't have a grantee showcase this year, but we are planning on having it sometime next spring, probably in March. So if you're interested um, in participating in that, please let me know. Um, my email is storo at imls.gov, but I'll put it in the chat box. And if anybody has any questions now, I'm happy to try to answer them. If you have a grant or if you submitted a grant or you just have a general question about IMLS. I'm wondering, did we have more people apply this year? Last year, I know there was a dip in applications. Was there more people that applied, more tribes that applied? There was more of a dip. 
oh, well, I know I yeah. got one tribe who hadn't applied in a while <laughs> to apply again. So Washington State had an uptick. That's or good, just yeah. a little one. So yeah. I, I, I mean, always say that the money is there. We should go for it. Absolutely. And uh, I forgot to mention that Congress actually gave us an additional million dollars. So we have even more money than we used to. Um, so it's sad to me that more tribes aren't applying, but at the same time, I understand there are lots of hurdles and hoops you have to go through to get the application submitted. So that's why I really try to figure out how can we, we can't make the process itself easier, but I'm wondering if there are ways that we can talk people through how to do it better. I think that would be something we could work on. So we'll work on that maybe as a group. Great. Didn't the increase go through the three thousand increase in the grant? Um, do you mean for the basic grants from right, right? There was an increase, yeah, from six or seven thousand up to ten thousand. Right. Okay. Thank and you. I, yep. And I noticed that I think some tribes didn't really read the notice of funding opportunity closely so they didn't realize they could get more money they just submitted the application for six thousand and so if I was able to in some cases I said did you realize that you could have applied for ten thousand <laughs> um, but we'll try to do a better job next year of letting people know and the deadlines will probably be the same, April 1st for the basics and May 1st for the enhancements and the Native Hawaiian. So would you say those again, April 1st for the basic? Yes, April 1st for the basics and May 1st for the um, enhancements and Native Hawaiian. Okay. And it, it depends on if it's a Sunday, a Saturday or Sunday, then it'll be like the next day. So, in other words, if it's, if it's a Saturday, you have till the following Monday, or the yes. or okay, following Monday. Okay. All right. Any questions? Again, I'm sure that you can get um, Sandra's email, and if you can't, I have it. And so, you know, if you can contact me, I'd be happy to give it to you or share it with you. I'd be um, putting it in chat. Actually, okay. Thirty there. Jeremy's okay. You did put it in there, yes, or you're thank going you, to. Jeremy. Okay, Jeremy's going to get there. There it goes. I see it. All right. Um, anything else? Um, not that I can think of. Right now, we're early in the process in terms of getting the IMLS budget approved, um, but we're all hopeful based on what happened this past year and the support that we've heard from different um members of Congress. So we we're keeping our fingers crossed, but um, we actually ended up getting more funding than we thought, um, even though it looked like we were on the chopping block for a little bit. And technically, I think, according to the, budget, uh, the president's proposed budget, we are still on the chopping block, but we get lots of encouraging um, messages from different representatives from Congress. So we're, that's why we're hopeful, I guess. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, um, anyone else have any questions? You, you can type them in chat if you don't want to unmute. But, um, okay. Well, Sandra, you are more than welcome to come to our in-person meeting if you wish to journey to um, Seattle and then uh, across the mountains to Yakima. It's a short plane flight, which I've taken. Uh, it's not, it's a good runway. There are some runways that I've flown into that are very short, but this one is not bad, not bad. So um, we, I'm sure that you would be more than welcome to join us if you um, could on uh, October, Tuesday, October 16th at the Yakima Tribe. So we would love to see you in person, um, but this is great. And if you can't come, we will phone, we will, we will arrange another phone um, phone time for you to join us because we appreciate your taking the time to answer questions oh, sure. or give us the the news from our funders we're always appreciative of that so anyone else well, have any you. anything for the good of the order um i had a question we booked a room to come to the meeting 
at the casino, like uh, for L WLA too. Mm -hmm. So is that close enough to the meeting? Marida, do you want to answer that or Jolina? Yeah, I'd say it's about 20 minutes away. What do you, what do you guys oh. say from Toppenish to uh, WLA to Yakima? Jolina or Kat? Um, yeah, it's not too far. It's like 20 minute drive. So, okay. no big thing. yeah, around here we're, we're just like used to, you know, making that drive from Toppenish to Yakima. But some people think it's a long ways, but yeah, it's just, it's, you just have to maybe. It's all freeway, pretty yeah, much. Put in yeah. like maybe 20 to 30 minutes to drive there. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, it, and the parking at the, if they're going to be at the same conference center it's been at before, it's usually pretty easy. It's right there, right across the street. So, you know. Okay. Any other questions? Well, Brian, we certainly welcome you as our newest meeting member. And if you have any, you can unmute and say anything. If you want to share any programs that may have been already going, or you can get a pass this time because you're brand new. Uh, two weeks? Is it two weeks? It seems to me it's two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah. Get a pass. <laughs> Very new. <laughs> yes. Thank you. You get a pass. <laughs> so, um, anything else anyone would like to share? Okay, well then we have done the good thing for a meeting. We are adjourned early. Our 90 minutes, I'd say that's pretty good. So, all right. Well, thank you everyone for coming. And uh, it's always good when we can share what's, what's going on. We learn from each other and uh, we're stronger together. And uh, I think that's wonderful when we can uh, learn, share. So I appreciate everyone's attendance. And again, this will go up. I will put um, the reference, the link that Ginny gave me and I will share it with everyone on Keepers List. And then Jeremy will share the link for the YouTube video so that people can come in and listen to this at a, at a later time who weren't able to make it. So again, thank you. And uh, we'll see you in Yakima.